hello, 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 and welcome back to another uh, of my videos. I am um, making this one as m I make many of my videos, primarily uh, for the audience of those involved in initial teacher education, sometimes also referred to as teacher training, and it would be valuable for those who are taking on board the award in education and training or the certificate or the diploma for that matter. Nevertheless, I think this particular piece of work has relevance to almost everyone who is involved in teaching and learning. Primarily as a focus on one particular issue which I think is of, of importance to explain, but also in a, a kind of more general terms about teaching and its philosophical and logical roots. Um, in order to pursue this path, can I firstly read you a letter from The Guardian which appeared on March 12th, 2017. It was signed by more than two dozen major thinkers, writers, researchers, and names, if you spell the word names with a big capital N. Uh, who um, have made an impact upon teaching and learning across Europe and the and, and United States of America. Uh, and the letter was a general missive to the profession itself, firing a shot across our bows about a particular issue. And in order to introduce that issue, I think I would be pleased if you if I could read you the first two paragraphs of this letter. And it goes like this. There is widespread interest among teachers in the use of neuroscientific research findings in educational practice. However, there are also misconceptions and myths that are supposedly based on sound neuroscience that are prevalent in our schools. We wish to draw attention to this problem by focusing on an educational practice supposedly based on neuroscience that lacks sufficient evidence and so we believe should not be promoted or supported. Generally known as learning styles, it is the belief that individuals can benefit from receiving information in their preferred format based on a self-report questionnaire. This belief has much intuitive appeal because individuals are better at some things than others and ultimately, there may be a brain basis for these differences. Learning styles promises to optimize education by tailoring materials to match the individual's preferred mode of sensory information processing. And that's the first two paragraphs of this particular letter. The respected individuals, I, I guess we would, have, would agree that they are respected individuals, I, I was reading through the list and I spotted Steven Pinker's name in there. So, you know, major figure in, uh, in neuroscience and uh, the relation of the brain to, to how we conceive of ourselves and how we learn. Uh, there's, there's every reason to take this warning about learning styles seriously. And in the process of doing that, I, I, I should point out that though this letter appeared in 2017, it refers to research that in fact first appeared in 2004. In other words, there is a, a long gap. 2017, 2004, it's 13 years. A 13 year gap between the business of when the first research drawing attention to the problem with learning styles appeared. And then a, a bunch of famous scientists having to draw attention to it again in the most serious of terms serious of terms by posting a letter not just in the Gu in the guardian but in other major newspapers which have a, an educational remit there is something to be said about that very act that it they would have to state that 13 years after the original research came into being the original research uh, I am proud to say came into being 
based on colleagues of mine, work of colleagues of mine, whom I've got huge respect for, Frank Caulfield, Catherine Eccleston, and two people I don't know, but uh, I, I've, I've, I've heard high report of David Mosley and Elaine Hall uh, from collectively the University of Newcastle, University of London, and the University of Exeter. And this particular research took a look at the many, many ways in which uh, instruments, that's to say, forms that one could fill in, uh, were used within the education profession and looked at whether there was any overall validity and consistency in the way in which these particular approaches produced verifiable and useful results that could be used in a way that would allow us to conceive of teaching and learning and gain some knowledge about what was going on within our students, our learners, if you want to call them that. The outcome from that research was damning. What became pretty clear was there was no consistency. That what you got was dependent on which particular process of examining learning styles you used. There was very little in the way which could be said about how this system operated. Now, can I point out that this illustrates some, a variety of things, some of which are far more serious than others, but it illustrates a variety of things. The first thing it illustrates is that in order to be able to pursue a particular piece of evidence, a particular piece of, of supportive theory within teaching and learning, one needs to have pretty good strong evidence in order to maintain it as a way of, of, of something we should use. If that doesn't exist, we should abandon it. And clearly, what is pretty clear from, the, from this research, and again, it's, it's not new, is now 16 years old. <laughs> it, it, we really should be abandoning the whole idea of learning styles in the way it which was, in which it was conceived back in, and examined back in 2004. Now, this is not to say that individual students, individual learners, might not have inclinations towards particular ways which they like pursuing their learning. It could well be that an individual person has got better eyesight than hearing, in which case it's pretty clear that communicating with them in, in visual terms is preferable to communicating with them, with, with them via, via uh, other means. So it, it is a is the research, there are always issues with regard to the physical abilities of students and their capacities as individuals and also their previous experiences which would give them a, 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 a kind of tendency or leaning with regard to how they engage with learning, especially in the case of people who are older. What is pretty true also is that young, lear young learners and old learners can be quite different in terms of their flexibility of learning. A very young learner, for instance, has not engaged with learning very much, hasn't gone through the formal systems of learning that an older learner might have done, and consequently is more adaptable to the way in which learning can be introduced to them. A child, for instance, is unlikely to have fixed versions of what learning might be somehow embossed into its brain. And certainly what is pretty clear is how using a learning style's analysis of any sort with a start with a with a child or, or with a with a teenager or even you know with any other adults it's not going to show them show, it's not going to show up exactly what that leaning will be because what comes out depends on which particular learning styles questionnaire learning styles approach learning styles system one uses what is even less consistent is the fact that if you use the same consistent learning styles approach with the same learners, you may get different results from time to time as a student's learning uh, develops and as their experience of learning develops. Students in particular, I can speak from my own personal experiences of this, one's learning approaches very greatly as one's confidence, one's understanding of oneself. And one's encounters with the world, and especially with other people, 
have an effect on you. If you're given confidence by your student, by your tutors, by your, the people around you, by your colleagues in particular, then the chances are you'll, you'll flower in your learning, you will continue to develop, and you will achieve much more wider capacity to be able to engage with sources of information, uh, math methods of engaging with information and knowledge, which you would have had if you had only had one particular approach to it. Variability tends to produce flexibility as people engage with the various ways in which learning can take place. Therefore, my conclusion from the whole process of the criticism of learning styles is not that people don't have inclinations from time to time about how they might learn. It's just that learning styles processes uh, are not going to show them. Now, I know some people are listening to this and think to themselves, my God, B, how can you tell me this after I've spent years, decades perhaps, using learning styles questionnaires with my groups? Are you telling me that all that was for nothing? Um, it is difficult for me to say this, but in some respects, you could have got the same results by engaging in drawing the, the tar, drawing their tarot card, so looking up their astrological chart. In other words, learning styles was a piece of pseudoscience. It is clearly shown to be a piece of pseudo pseudoscience. You can find out how people like to learn and what they enjoy most in learning, and what inclinations they have by getting to know your students. And my view has always been that one of the primary issues that we often forget in the basis of, of engaging in teaching and learning and the teaching and learning profession is the ability to be an approachable individual whom a student can get to know and you'd get to know them can tell you as much about their capacities and their abilities and their limitations in learning as you would have ever got by effectively waving a dead chicken over them. You know, this is, uh, we need effective systems in order to be able to, be able to say that our teaching and learning is, effect, is, is, is useful and applicable and does in fact work. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. Now, this raises other problems, and I think even more serious ones. First of all, as the letter pointed out, and I'll come go back to it, and uh, if I can, read you the section concerned. Uh, there is widespread interest among teachers in the use of neuroscientific research, research findings in educational practice. However, and this is the bit, there are also misconceptions and myths that are supposedly based on sound neuroscience that are prevalent in our schools. They do not say myth in the singular. They say myths in the plural. And this is the warning shot. How much of what we understand in terms of teaching and learning is based on sound evidence? How much is based on recent research and evidence. How much is based on professional application of that research and evidence, and not simply on doing what one's superiors tell one to do. It is insufficient, for instance, in a teaching and learning session to be told to use learning styles and then cynically to do so when one has no confidence in the, in, the, in the process. And any institution that's continuing to do that is letting its tutors down, letting its students down, and in effect, continuing to, to promote something that's pure mythology and superstition. They should be abandoned, and there should, there needs to be, I mean, clearly needs to be, after 16 years' worth of critique, a revision in the way in which we do things, not just in terms of learning styles, but a wholesale revision of the way in which teaching and learning operates and the foundational evidence that, that supports it. One of the things that's, that's I've felt very strongly over my 36 
coming on to 40 years worth of experience in teaching and learning and much of the reading I have done, is that it's alarming to consider that our profession, a very, very important profession in the sense that the lives of individuals are often in our hands, their futures in our hands, their well-being is in our hands, is often based on unsee unsure foundations. Where is the solid evidence that supports much practice in the classroom? Is not the issue of uh, the mythology of learning styles an indicator that we need to take great care about what we select in terms of methodological systems and also the underpinning theory that makes those methodolo methodological systems worthwhile pursuing. In particular, it is very alarming to discover that much that passes for learning theory consists of a grab bag of historical elements which are produced in sessions for new teachers. So new teachers will be told about behaviorism, for instance, they'll be taught about, taught about constructivism, they'll be, talked about, they'll be told about the old-fashioned didactic method, they'll be told, told about banking, the banking method from Paulo Freire, etc., etc. They'll hear many theories from many sources with different isms attached to it. And then that will be that. As if somehow this gives us a foundation. Well, it doesn't. What it does, it gives us multiple different possible theories, but not one which really says, this is how teaching and learning work. And surely we should be pursuing that. We should be pursuing something that looks vaguely like a grand, if you like, a grand unified theory of learning which has a, a reasonably solid dialectical foundation. I use the word dialectical because what I mean to say that as a thesis, a, such a grand unified theory of learning would still be subject to critique, but it would be a system which was pretty sound and we would expect it to be revised as time goes on, as our knowledge and as our evidence deepens. My concern is that very often this has ceased happening. We have got into the habit as teachers, of te as teachers and learners of recycling systems of learning which at the end of the day are unchallenged. And if they're unchallenged, how can we know they're founded? I am not going to sit here and la lay out for you an answer to this question. I do believe that there is a underlying conceptual basis, a philosophical conceptual basis which has logical foundations and which takes into account many of the key fa factors of, of, of learning theory which have existed in the past. I think there, are, there, are, there is a way of uniting them and I think you know, the, the, the research work should be, got, should be started to pursue that and you know, more writing should be done upon it. But however, I'm not going to try to lie, you know, lay out those grounds in this video. What I want to do is to offer a warning. And the warning is we should be more circumspect about our conceptual beliefs. Look for foundational rationality within a learning theory. And you will probably gain a degree of, of knowledge from it which is useful to put into practice. And there is a lot there which is pretty sound, I believe. However, critical dialogue between teachers, colleagues, staff of all types within our learning institutions is vital in order to be able to pursue this particular issue. And if that's not happening, if we're not getting the opportunity to do that, then literally we are not pursuing the kind of evidence-based, led evidence-led processes that hopefully we should be uh, 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 pursuing at all costs, I would believe, in order to do the best we can, both for ourselves and for, and for the people we teach. If you get the message that learning styles are a mythology and should be abandoned, and you're hostile to that, don't worry, I sympathize. It is not good for Big Groves McDaniel to sit here on a video 
and tell you that something that you believe is wrong. And I, I am often embarrassed in saying it, but I can't sit back and say nothing to save the feelings of individuals who may wish to resist the findings of the good, the great, and the people who have researched this subject and shown it to be defective. Therefore, I hope you will consider what I've had to say here and um, pursue perhaps a little bit of interest in, in, in the research itself. There are, it's readily available online. And look into its, its rationale. Secondly, that it will, I hope, provide a framework of passionate interest in teaching and learning as a subject which is not just about what happens in the classroom, but why things happen the way they do in the classroom. It is insufficient for us to go out there and just teach without knowing why we do what we do. And that subject, I think, is one which we do not debate enough. With that, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this stimulating, perhaps even annoying, uh, whatever the case, um, um, thank you for your time. And I shall see you again at some point. Bye-bye.